Mary Meet, Annie here. Welcome to the first video in my stones series. I've been wanting to do this stone series for quite some time now. And I have been tickled into starting it because I am involved in an off YouTube project where once a month I am writing in a newsletter on the subject of stones, taking up a different one each month. So it seemed the perfect time to blend this with that. Let me begin by saying a little bit about how I relate to stones. I use them as bone work, divination. The same divination one would use with casting staves, casting runes, reading the tarot. That's all forms of things I learned as earthwork divination and was taught to call it bone work. I don't work with the stones in the sense of energy. And by that I mean I don't work with stones that the laying on of a certain stone or the holding of a certain stone brings a literal energy into my body. I work with the stones as symbols. As you would work with the symbols of the runes, it is what it opens up in the mind, how it deepens your intuition, what it has spoken to you in the past that has resonated with you, which you've learned from it and can reuse every time you revisit it. So when I work with stones, I am working with them as creatures of divination, creatures of knowledge. Yes, I can hold a certain stone in my hand and go to a certain place because I have ascribed that stone a certain meaning. But I did want to make it clear that I do not work specifically with energy of the stones because there are those who work that way and it's very powerful. And I did want to make a distinction in the way I work with stones. The series is going to include as many stones as I get around to doing. It will begin for many stones with the ones I work with the most often, my core stones. I am adding, even now, stones to that as I obtain a new stone and learn about a new stone and deepen my relationship to new stones. But I work always with a certain core set of stones that I have come to know well, working with them probably for about ooh, 35 years now. I'm going to share with you the meanings I have ascribed from years of experience to various stones. Where did the information come from? Well, some of it I was told. And some of what I was told resonated with me over time, and my work with the stones seemed to back it up. Other things I was told about individual stones, I no longer consider to be a correspondence to that stone, not in the way the stone speaks to me. And in keeping with that, there are things that I feel strongly or the knowledge of certain stones others may not feel. So I collect that information. I've been collecting it all these years. Specifically, at this point, <laughs> I collect it in a binder. And this is the binder that all of the information on the stones that I work with regularly exists in. I add to that still because especially as the internet became available and more people's experiences with the stones became available, more knowledge about the lore, the history, the ancient contemporary use of different stones all became part of what I collected in my book on stones. Now in this series, what I'm going to share about each one is my general overall take on the knowledge is, that is given to us by that particular stone and I'm going to break it down specifically into a few categories. The first category is the correspondence of the stone to things personal. Things of the psyche, things of the personality, in a way things which are internal to each of us. Knowing what a certain stone means to us at a personal level. The next category of information that I have researched, used, and will share is what the stone means with you in relationship to community. It's the outward expression of the stone. Yes, it's still what it means to you, but it has to do with what it means in relation to others. So it's the outward projecting experience rather than the inward receptive experience of the stone. 
I then will share my thoughts on that stone used in spiritual work, in magic, spell work, prayer, and meditation. I'm going to share a little bit about the stone's history, what it might be used for when it comes to issues of health. I'm not going to be going into that as in-depth though, because as you can guess, since I don't use stones as an energy source, but as a source of meditation and spell work at that level, I don't work directly hands-on with the laying on of the stones or the use of the energy of the stones in healing. I'm going to share that though because I've collected it over the years knowing that at some point the stones could resound with me that way. And so I want to share that because some of you have a relationship with the stones that is at that energetic level and you would do something as simple as lay a certain stone on a hurt body part or hold it against the head to get rid of a migraine or any of those things where it's used for health. I'm going to mention some of what I have read and know about that, but it's not my area of expertise when it comes to the stones. I use it more for divination. Health comes into the picture if it indicates that there is perhaps a problem in a certain area or something that could be done to improve the health in a certain area. But that's different, I think, than working with stones as energetic healing. So I encourage, if you're beginning, or even if you're revisiting stones and haven't used them for a while, to think about what categories of correspondence you would assign stones. And think about collecting lore and history about each stone, where it comes from in the world, how it's been used through history. The lore of, of a stone can be a powerful way to develop a bond with the stone. I'm also, in between every stone correspondence and discussion that I bring up on a specific stone, going to introduce a certain form of casting. I have oodles and oodles of way that I cast stones, some of which mimic tarot spreads, some of which mimic rune spreads, most of which are things either teachers over the years have showed me or other stone readers have showed me, and in all honesty, the majority of them they are things that I just developed over time that were an instinctive tool that a certain way of looking at the layout, the fall of stones that are cast, brings certain knowledge to my mind, a certain feeling or instinct to my mind. So I will be sharing not only correspondence on various stones, but various stone castings. If you already do stone casting, you might be seeing something new to try, and if you haven't done stone castings, it might give you something as an idea of what to do with your stones. So as an aside, you might be interested in this series, but you're going, I don't even have any stones. Not in the budget, or I live in a situation where I simply cannot collect things like that. It would cause discomfort amongst other people. Or maybe just simply don't have access to stones. I want to suggest this to you, if the idea of stones appeals to you, and in time you hope to be able to collect stones to work with, think about when we work with runes. They're usually on some kind of stone or bone. It's the symbol that's on it that brings us the instinct, the insight, the guidance we're looking for. If, for whatever reason, at the moment you're intrigued with the idea of the symbolism, and knowledge that can be gained and using stones and divination but don't have or don't anticipate having for a while stones to work with, use pebbles. Assign each pebble the name of a stone. If you have to mark it in some way, you probably will think of whether you want to do something as basic as numbering it or putting the first letter of the stone you want it to be, whatever you want to do. So that by association, you could hold any old stone in your hand, but know that it's obsidian. And that it will be everything that obsidian stands for. Or that it will be agate or carnelian, whatever. Not having the means, or being in a situation where you simply cannot collect stones for whatever reason, doesn't keep you from working with the symbolism of the stones. It is a portal to instinct and knowledge. It's a divinatory tool. So like working with staves or runes or cards, it can be as simple 
as small river stones. You have assigned your obsidian, your moonstone, and take it from there. I never want to do a video where I'm encouraging anyone to feel that purchase of something is required. Yes, working with the exact stone is easier, and in all honesty, most of my stones are inexpensive tumbled stones because when I started doing stonework, I could not have purchased anything of any great financial value. I'd suggest if you collect stones, keep them together. The stones that you're going to use for your divinatory purposes, for your casting, keep them together. They have a relationship with each other. And separating them out, keeping them in plastic bags separate from each other, keeping them in separate places, and then rounding them all up when you want to do a casting, I can almost guarantee you it won't work quite right for you. I keep my stones on my altar in a container. I think it was meant to be an incense container for briquettes or sand. That's where they stay. I've also discovered my stones don't want to be in a bag. We think of protecting our divinatory tools like we do with the tarot and even the runes sometimes or the staves by keeping them in a nice lined safe bag. Stones seem to want to be out in the daylight, in the room light, in the moonlight. They don't seem to like to be all bagged up. So think about how it feels to you and decide how you want to keep your stones. I do encourage you keep them together. I also suggest that you come up with five stones that will not be the stones that you'll use for divinatory purposes. They are best gathered from the land you live on. I suggest you gather four stones that will represent the four elements, and you'll see why when I show you some of my casting suggestions and my own way to do a casting. And then, very importantly, find a stone, a pebble, where you live, about the same size as the tumbled stones you're going to be using in your divination and your castings. Find a stone of the land you live on. That stone in the mix is going to be you, your center, your place of grounding, you in the stone mix, and keep that stone in with the other stones that you'll be using. My elemental stones are more like elemental rocks. I don't keep them with my other stones. I bring them out to set up the circle within which I will cast my stones. But my stone, the one that represents me, it lives in that little container I showed you with all of my tumbled stones. And in casting videos, I will show you how I use the stone, which is you. Now, as you know, I like my spheres. That's certainly not something I had early in my practice, and not even for the first half of the years I've practiced. Basically, money, no money to buy supplies of any kind. I was really lucky any time I come up with a few extra bucks and could buy a small one or two inch piece of tumbled stone to use in my collection. As far as the like back here, the stones you see behind me, they're recently, I guess maybe no more, no older, I don't think any of them, than 20 years old. I use the severes, like you might guess, not to hold in my hand for a certain energy. I use them when I am working with a certain stone, one has come up in divination, or I'm focusing on the aspects of a particular stone, or want to use the aspects of a particular stone in spell work. I use the sphere on my altar as a center of focus. There's lots of other ways one could use spheres, but what I have is for every one of the tumbled stones that I work with, I do have its relative sphere. I enjoy that so much. It's been a great gift to me that over the years I've been able to do that. Totally, my friends, unnecessary. The smallest of polished stones on your altar, representing a work in progress, is fine. A pebble that you have assigned the qualities of a certain stone placed on your altar is fine. I just happen to have some pretties and I do really enjoy an altar that is holding the knowledge of one of the spheres in my workings. Let me at this point, since I'm talking about stones and spheres and altars, this has nothing 
to do with my relationship to my crystal ball. If you've watched my video on Sophia, there's a relationship there. There is energy there. She is an entity in her own right. So when I say I don't particularly work with the energetic fields of stones in my divination, I am not including my crystal ball, Sophia, in with that. That is something completely different. So my last piece of advice in this introductory video, if you want to try working with stones, whether you have stones, or declare a common stone to be everything that a certain stone would be if you had it in reality. After all, my friends, we work magic. We know how to do this. Last piece of advice I'm going to have here because I wanted to keep the more generic kind of things in this introductory video. When you work with your stones, come up with some repeating pattern of working with them that works for you. Just like those of you who cast runes or staves or work with the tarot, you have a way in which you set time aside, focus yourself, quiet yourself, open yourself up to the possibility, the messages that will come to you through working with your chosen tool. Do the same thing when it comes to working with your stones. Before you cast your stones, decide what little mini right you will follow. For me, it's simple. I have a certain working table. It's my working altar I always set up. I cover it with a certain cloth. I lay my elemental stones on it because a lot of the work that I do will be aligned to elemental energies. Sophia always sits on my working altar when I work with the stones. She seems to magnify my ability to read their message. There is a candle and there will be incense. No involved ritual. I don't cast a circle to do this kind of reading, whether it's for myself. And one of the things I love about stones, why they appeal to me the strongest. When I tried all forms of divination, a lot of them worked when I was trying to read for others, but none worked equally as well when I wanted to read for myself. That's where my fascination with stones began. But I don't enter into that with some convoluted rite. I can. I can make working with my stones be part of a ritual. But if I just want to settle down and do a journey after casting stones, it's simple for me. Set up my working altar, cover it, elemental stones. Sophia always joins me for this working. A little incense because I just love incense. And a candle. The candle helps if I need to focus and also it helps me be aware of time passing. So this has been kind of a little primer, a little 101 leading into the series that I am about to do. I hope that you will put any questions you have about stone casting, stone correspondences and reading of the stones into the comments below. That way I can make sure I address them in future videos. And please, if you are so called, I hope that you will be an active participant in the series. I would like to hear your experiences on any of the stones I talk about. I will learn a lot from you if you would consider that kind of sharing. I hope you enjoy the series. I wish you mirth and reverence. Merry part.